Get all the puppies. No, I'm just kidding. So this is my first Father's Day that my son, who's in the back and playing drums, is a father, and my grandchild is here. So that is wonderful. And every once in a while, somebody would come to, to me and say, you know, I never had kids. And I say, borrow some of mine. <laughs> Plenty. Just take a couple. For just a few weeks, you'll send them back. I promise. After they start eating at your house, you'll be like, how do you afford this? And I go, I don't. Uh, so today we're going to talk about how to have daily victory in Christ. How to have daily victory in Christ. And uh, it's, it's, this is not specifically a Father's Day message. It really applies to everybody, but it's really about spiritual warfare. You know, when I was a kid, my dad took my brother and I out to the Everglades, and for whatever reason, and we probably talked him into it, honestly, uh, we were about 8, 10, maybe 10, I think 10 or 12, uh, and he decided to go out, and we were in a regular, just a Chevy pickup truck, and... Uh, uh, all these guys were out four-wheeling in the mud, and we said, Dad, let's go, and he took us out there, and as we were going out, all of a sudden, we got stuck at the exact time that all the four-wheel drive trucks left. We were in the Everglades, in a truck, 200 yards from any road, not even paved. We're not going to talk about paved, dirt road, way out. By the way, there's probably houses there now. Uh, but, but, uh, uh, and so my dad did what every good father would do. He said, boys, um, I'm going to get help. If anybody comes, just get in the floorboard of the truck. And he left us for hours. I felt like I, it might've been an hour. It was a long time and no water, no food, no, no weapons to fend off the alligators and snakes, which were obviously surrounding us. And we didn't think a thing about it. I mean, I do now as a parent. And he came back and somebody with a four-wheel drive truck pulled us out and we went home. And I, I got to thinking about today's message and I thought, you know, one of the things that happens to us is we don't recognize that we're stuck. Have you ever met somebody that you just know is kind of stuck and you want to help them, but they don't even know they need help and they're just stuck. They're, they're either stuck in an old habit or, or they have some type of uh, a hang up that gets to them or some kind of hurt that they're always bringing up. You know, they're always talking about somebody that hurt them, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago and telling you that and they're stuck. And here's what we don't realize sometimes. You are more than just a physical person. Um, we really, and one of the ways we talk about it is you're really at least uh, uh, three parts, maybe more. People argue about this, and I'm not going to argue with you. I'll nod at you and say, that sounds good to me too. But here's the thing. Let's talk about spiritual, physical, and emotional. And today, we're in church, so we're going to talk about the spiritual. And we're going to look in Revelation at this crazy battle, which sounds like something out of Narnia. I mean, it's just, just kind of nuts. It's, it's a, a, a full dragon mode, literal. And, and so we're going to look at that. That's the spiritual. And what we don't understand sometimes is your physical how you feel, sometimes even your hormones getting off, some of you know about that, right? Uh, uh, your physical can affect your emotional, right? I mean, haven't you, e haven't you ever had too much caffeine? One or three Celsius, don't do that. But anyway, so, you know, and the truth is, too much of something or whatever can throw you off physically, which all of a sudden you find that emotionally you're on edge, you're frustrated, you're irritated. Some of you here this morning like, maybe that's what's wrong with me, right? But here's the thing, you're also spiritual. And sometimes what we relegate to emotional or physical is truthfully a spiritual battle. And let me give you one more thing. You are not Tupperware. So things are not designated spiritual, physical, emotional. Truthfully, when you're struggling with one, you'll struggle with another. And so never, listen, never underestimate the spiritual battle going on in your life. And fathers and dads and men, let me tell you something specifically for you. I absolutely believe for many years there's been a war on men to keep you from being who God wants you to be. You, they, they try to tell you you're Homer Simpson, 
and you're just an idiot, and you just, you know, you're lucky to even be at the house, and, and all this stuff, when God has called you to lead, and to battle, and to pray for your family, and encourage your family, and to help them along on this journey, and not just being in the background going, well, I don't know, I'm just going to turn the channel. Which, by the way, I always think that's what Adam was doing in the book of Genesis, right? It says his wife was talking to the snake, and what's he doing? Uh-huh. Right? Right? And so, so here's the truth. God wants you to do this. So today, as we look at these things, I don't want you to be stuck. And ladies, this sermon's for you too, because it's not just for men. It's in the book of Revelation, and it's some heavy stuff that we're going to deal with today, but I'm going to try to focus on some things that you can do something about. So here we go. Number one, recognize your daily spiritual war. Even this morning, some of you had such a hard time even getting here. Haven't you ever wondered why there's so much trouble on Sunday morning? I really believe that some of it is spiritual. Not all of it. Some of it has to do with preparation, <clears throat> you know, uh, by the way, you don't need to speed if you leave on time. Have you ever? <laughs> but why would that need to happen, right? Okay, so, so here it goes. Then a war broke out in heaven. Michael, remember he's the main angel, and his angels fought against the dragon. And typically, Old Testament, when they talk about the dragon, it's any uh, society that goes against Israel. Like, that's something new, right? So, so uh, uh, the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to earth, and his angels with them. Time out. So this is talking about before human time, that there was a war in heaven, and Satan was cast out of heaven. And so people have talked about you know, him being the, the music angel and all this other stuff, but the truth is, what did he do? Pridefully, he rose against God, and here it's talking about he's thrown out of heaven. By the way, not all these illustrations just mean one thing, but I've only got so much time today. Here we go. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. Now, if you miss the rest of the verses, hang on to these because these are huge for you and for me. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters. And by the way, if accuser wasn't enough, he has to emphasize it. Who accuses them before our God day and night. That sounds like Job, doesn't it? Day and night has been hurled down. And then it says, they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. So John is writing this. John, who's lost all his friends, all his other disciples have been martyred. And here's John on the island of Patmos, maybe working in the quarry. And he is saying to us through Jesus, the accuser of the brethren. And so people sometimes say to me, Eric, how do I know if I'm in a spiritual battle? And this one's an easy one to identify. Because the truth is, for some of you, you struggle with accusation all the time. I'm not talking about accusation without. I mean, that may be your struggle too, that you accuse everybody else. But the truth is, you may struggle with accusation. And and let me give you a few I wrote down. I was thinking of dads and I I wrote down a few of them. You're worthless. Maybe that's what you hear in your head. You're worthless. You You don't matter. You're a failure. You don't measure up to other people. You can't do anything right. Sometimes what we hear is, you're always doing that kind of stuff. And then here's the worst one. I've had, many of you may know that my father took his own life, and I've also had several friends take their life, and this is something that I've heard from their families afterwards, every time. You're in everyone's way. You are in everyone's way. The enemy will try to convince you that you don't need to be here. You don't matter. Why? Because in the Bible, there's two commands. Jesus said two commands, right? Love God and love people, right? Love people as you love yourself, right? So you got to love yourself. So he's trying to get you to not love you. Why? Because then you can't love other people. 
If you're walking around going all the time and the enemy is telling you you're worthless, well, then you think you can't add value to others. So why are you going to help anyone else if all you're thinking about is how worthless you are? And the enemy wants to convince you that you are worthless and you don't add worth to anyone else. You know, you know, I, this morning as I was praying on the way here and I was praying for different people and I'm weird, I'm very visual. I know that's a shocker to you guys, but, but one of the things, it makes it easy to remember stories and terrible to remember anything else, but, but don't even ask me math stuff. Uh, uh, but I'm on the way here and I imagine myself walking through the building and praying for the different people that I see as I walk through. That's how I pray. I can, I can see in my head all this stuff. And as I was doing that, I imagined God pouring into me. Why? So that I could pour into other people. And so the next time you feel worthless, remind the enemy that you have worth. Why? Because God gave it to you. Not because of how pretty you are. Not because of how smart you are. Thank God for that. Right? Not because you never do anything stupid. Sometimes you do. You know, sometimes the enemy comes to me and says, Eric, you're an idiot. You, don't do, you should not be the pastor. And here's what I answer. You're exactly right. That's exactly right. But because of God's grace. And so you receive God's grace when the accuser comes at you and he will come at you. And, and by the way, a lot of times at night. A lot of times at night, he'll come at you. He will accuse you of all. He'll remind you of every failure. Why can't our dreams be about our successes? Why are our reminders always about our failures? Because the accuser is coming in going, ha ha, you remember that time. Can't believe you said that. Can you? And the next thing you know, you start to, and then you don't want to help. You don't want to encourage. You don't want to bless. You get depressed enough, it affects you physically, it affects you emotionally, and it's really a spiritual battle that you're in. So recognize it first, identify it, wait a second, where are these thoughts coming from? Why do I think this? By the way, some of you grew up in a home where your parents were tormented and they released this on you. So they told you, you're a failure, you're worthless, you're in the way, you're a mess, you're a this, and you need to start saying, that's not true, that's not not what God says about me. By the way, remember who the perfect father is. It's not your, you may have had a wonderful, you may have had a horrible dad. You may have had a wonderful dad. If you had the best dad in the room, guess what? Nowhere near how good God is. And so you say, God, thank you that you not told me that. For our struggle, Ephesians 6, 12, is not against flesh and blood, but I love this, against the rulers. That's like the dragons, right? against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You are in a spiritual battle. You may not realize it, but, but haven't you ever wondered why you get angry so fast? You, get, you have to wake up discouraged because the enemy is coming after you. He wants you to fail. But God wants to pour grace, pour love into you. Why? So that you can pour it out on other people. When you start to recognize God's love for you, yeah, you mess up. When the enemy tells me, Eric, you're messed up, I'm like, yep, absolutely. That's how good God is. The victory is by his blood and our testimony. That's what it says in that verse. His blood and our testimony. So what does that mean? The victory is by his blood. It means he paid for it. It means Jesus gave everything for you. Imagine if you came over, this is not going to happen, what I'm about to tell you, just so you know. But imagine you came over to my house and I said, you know what, I like you so much. Here's the keys to my house and my car. We're, I'm leaving, I'm moving out. There you go. That's not happening. Just <laughs> letting you know. Because I'd have to answer to my wife. But anyway, so, uh, right? And so what if that happened? That'd be an amazing gift. Here's the thing. God gave you more than that. Jesus gave his blood for you. Basically, he gave everything to you. So the next time you're thinking, I can't overcome this, it says in the Bible, you overcame what? By his blood. Not because you're worthy, not because you're good enough, smart enough, have it together enough. It's the reason you can't earn your way to salvation. If you're here to thinking, oh, if I just do enough good things and I can earn my way to heaven, no, you never will. I don't care how many good things you do. Now, that, that's not an excuse for sin, but the truth is, you can't earn your way there. What? By the blood of the Lamb. 
and then the word of our testimony. What's, a, what's our testimony? Our testimony is not just how we became a Christian. Most people confuse that. They think testimony is just how you become a Christian. That is a testimony, but your testimony is also the fact. You ready? Ready? You're here today, right? You survived something. God walked you through something for you to be here today. Your testimony is, you know what, God? You are so good that you walked me through that difficult situation, that circumstance, that struggle, that difficulty. And you know what happens when you begin to realize how much you've been getting, even on your worst day, even on the day when you feel like a failure, even on the day when the enemy comes after you, you say, God has made me through this. And as you look back and you're thankful, what happens? You begin to overcome. Why? Because of the blood of the lamb, what he gave for you, and your testimony, recognizing all that God has done for you, in you, with you. I mean, when's the last time you said, God, I don't deserve all the goodness you've given me? Number two, endure and be faithful during trials. You ever heard these words? It's not fair. And if you had a dad, then he repeated this to you. Life's not fair. And you're like, that's not the answer I was looking for. Here's the truth. Life's not fair. We're not in heaven yet. If we were in heaven, everything would be fair, everything would be just, everything would be righteous. The earth is not fair. Some people will suffer that don't deserve to suffer. Some people will hurt that don't deserve to hurt. Some people will die that don't deserve to die. Now, I don't know how you define that. I better turn the air down because there's people fanning. Like, after it gets to three people, I'm told you have to do it. Usually you're the one who tells me. No. Okay. Sorry. Listen to what it says here in Revelation 13, 8 through 10. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. And it's talking about the seven hills, which probably represents Rome, but we don't know that for sure. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. How do you get your name written in the Lamb's book of life? You surrender your life to Jesus. Jesus shed his blood for you, so now it's called the Lamb's Book of Life, which means when your name is written in there, that's a, that's a, a okay, let's check the book here, right? And then it says, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. And then it says, whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, Jesus will release them, and you're going to be, fr that's not what it says. If I was a TV preacher, I'd have to change this passage. It says, if anyone's going to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. Well, that's not really encouraging, John. You're not really helping me out. Okay. And then he says, if anyone's to be killed with the sword, it's going to work out, right? Uh, that's not what it says. To the sword, they'll be killed. Now, think of this. John, as he's saying this, is thinking about friends who were martyred for their faith, who refused to deny Jesus at the worst time. He knew that would happen. And then it continues. This calls for what? Patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Let me tell you what John's saying to us in this passage, what Jesus is saying to, through John. You can't control everything. Uh, let, me just, let me just help you. We love to control things. I love to. I, if I had a Mr. Microphone that could talk to other drivers, we would all be in trouble. Right. If I could do, you know, move that guy in the left lane out of the way, I would do it. Right. But when we can't control something, if we're not careful, what do we do now? We make it worse. We now have added anger, worry. Somebody said to me one time, you know, worry doesn't help anything. I go, no, no, no. It helps your blood pressure be bad, gives you gray hair. You know, it helps all kind of stuff. All the bad stuff, right? When you try to control. Think about Jesus. You know, they, the, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus. What do I need to do? He says, I'll go sell your stuff. And the rich young ruler just walks off. Jesus didn't grab him. Didn't yell for him to come back. Didn't send lightning or, or an earth. I mean, he could have done anything. And what did he do? He let him go. Love is about free will. And I will tell you one of the hardest things when I was a youth pastor to tell teenage parents is... You give them boundaries, but they have to make their decisions. 
You give them boundaries and consequences of their decisions, but they're deciding whether or not. They have the freedom to be dumb or smart, just like we do. Control is about, I'm going to force you to do, you're going to do it with you. And listen, so many things in life you can't control. And you realize that when you go to the doctor and they tell you something and you go, but I've always been healthy. <laughs> yeah, oh, whatever. When you can't control things, I want to encourage you to do a couple things. First of all, if you find that you get angry when you can't control something, realize that that's a pride issue. And sometimes you just have to say, God, forgive me, I'm not you. I surrender this to you. I, and it could be something as silly as, you know, wanting to go a little faster. It, it, can be, it can be something serious like a doctor telling you something. But you say, God, I release that to you. Maybe you need to forgive somebody who hurt you. That doesn't mean that what you're saying, what they did was right, but you're saying, I couldn't control it, I couldn't fix it, I didn't cause it, but I release it. Why? To those who will be in captivity will be taken into captivity. And God, I release my need for control. I love what Hebrews 12, 3 says. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners. Why? So that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So here's your next encouragement. Remember Christ's endur endurance during trials. When you're dealing with something you don't like, and we all deal with, you're not in heaven yet. Say, Jesus, thank you that you went to the cross. Thank you for what you endured. Thank you for what you walked through. By the way, for some of us, that's physical. For some of us, that's spiritual. And for some of us, it's emotional. I'm doing a funeral for a guy today I've known for years. He struggled with emotional wellness, mental health his whole life. I mean, amazing stories about what he dealt with and still was kind to other people. I love this quote. The chief weapon we ought to use in resisting Satan is the Bible. Some of you need to get a verse if you're struggling with anger. You need to get a verse on anger and put it in your car. Put it on your phone. Put it in your bathroom. Put it on your forehead. You know, whatever to say, I'm going to deal with whatever this issue is. Number three, focus your worship on Christ. Because of the signs, it was given power to be formed on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image to honor the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. Happy Father's Day. Have a great day. No. All right. And then listen to this. It also, and you've heard about this part, it also forced all the people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead so they could not buy, sell, unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast, the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast for the number of a man. That number is 666, which, by the way, a lot of theologians say that was what Nero's name was. Let me tell you the truth about this. Since the Civil War and before, people have guessed at what the mark of the beast is. When people first started writing checks, remember checks? Last time I went to public, somebody in front of me wrote a check. I think I was there for 45 minutes waiting for them, right? right? When checks first came out, that was the mark of the beast. When credit cards first came out, that was the mark of the beast. When social security numbers first came out, Mark, you getting the idea? And so all these years, so, so let me help you. We don't know what this means. I don't care how many people tell you they know what it means. They don't know what it means. But here's what I'll tell you. The next verse in the next chapter talks about people who overcame. And here's the deal. What did they do? They worshiped Christ. If you make worship the focus of your life, all of these other things won't pull you away. If you're struggling right now mentally, emotionally, 
physically, spiritually, begin to make worship part of your life. They came out with these new glasses that are supposed to help you uh, when you're motion sick, and they've got liquid in the bottom, and it helps to recalibrate your brain so you know which way. By the way, I get motion sick all the time. I literally am thinking about ordering these. And, and so, so it, moves, it looks really weird, but who cares if you feel sick? It's the worst feeling in the world to feel sick. And so, how many of you get motion sick? Anybody besides me? I'm like the most motion sick person. I learned how to drive a bus because I get motion sick in a bus. That's sad. Okay, so what do they do? They recalibrate you. Let me tell you something about worship. When you're struggling, when you're frustrated, if you will turn your heart towards worship, and worship's not just music, but music is very helpful in worship. Why? Because it combines praying to music and scripture and all the things that help us to worship. This last song we're going to do today is a perfect reminder of why we need to worship. James 4, 7. If you don't remember anything else today, if you will make this verse your life, this is spiritual warfare in one verse. Submit yourselves then to God. God, I surrender all to you. Resist the devil. Don't just give in to whatever he's planting in you. Those accusations, those frustrations, those temptations. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's spiritual warfare in a nutshell. Your last challenge today, surrender yourself to God. Resist Satan. My dad's been gone for a long time. I have some great memories of my dad, but I was a teenager when he died. My dad gave in to the voice that said, you're worthless you don't matter. You're not needed. You may still be alive and have given in to that voice. I want to encourage you. Reject those accusations from the enemy and say, God, I submit to you. Let him pour his love, his grace, his care into your life. Why? Because as you get full of that, that grace and love from God, you can pour that out on other people. Do you deserve it? No. But he did it for you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you after the bacon and after the service about what it means to become a Christian. Pray with you. Maybe you want to surrender your life to him. The truth is, some of you have been listening to a lot of accusations. I want you to recognize the spiritual battle you're in and don't give up. Keep fighting, keep warring, keep persevering, and I pray that God would pour his blessings on you as you overcome. Let's close in prayer today. Would you join me? Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your love for us. Father, some of these passages in Revelation are just overwhelming. The battle that's going on is beyond even our thought process, but Father, I pray that you would give us insight into the battle that goes on inside of so many of us. And Lord, our friends, Lord, I pray that we would pray for our friends when our friends come to us and tell us what they're hearing, what they're thinking, that we would realize that it's also a spiritual battle and that we would also fight for our friends and our family members. Lord, there's families today that are struggling that are here. I pray that you would give them your grace. Lord, I pray that those accusations would go away and your grace would overwhelm each family represented. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have our time of giving.